chapter 1. This is Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect. Exiles scattered throughout the providence, our provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. I want to start with talking about God's foreknowledge. It says that we were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. What does foreknowledge even mean? It means to know something before it happens or before it exists. That is the definition. And what it's telling us is before we existed, God knew. Amen? Uh, I want to go to Psalm 139 because it's always... One thing that can be difficult sometimes when you're speaking the Word of God or you're speaking truth to people is to assume that people uh, understand that God knew them prior to, being, uh, prior to the creation of the world. So Psalm 139.13, I just want to read to you what it says here. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works, and wonder, uh, your, uh, your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book. Before I move on from that verse, I want to read that one more time, and I want you to let that sink in. It says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book. Written, that's a past tense term. Amen? Before one of them came to be, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. I just want to leave it at that. God foreknew you before he created the heavens and the earth. And I want you to really, before I move on, wrap your head around everything good and bad that has taken place in this world from the point of creation to now. Everything that had to be so exact, so precise, so right for you to be here today. Not just all the good, but all of the bad. Is that sinking in this morning? Next verse it says, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So I'm going to, so I, I don't confuse anybody, I'm going to start from the beginning again. Two gods elect, exile scattered through, and I'm going to skip through the, the list of names because he's really speaking to all of us. Who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So what does that mean? This means that, that those of us who are in Christ, the Holy Spirit is conforming us to the image of Christ. It is, a, it is a work that the Holy Spirit is doing in you. Apart from God, apart from His Spirit, you will not be sanctified. You cannot be sanctified. That is the work that He is doing. And, and, and I want to, to, to conclude this whole thought with the final a uh, person within the Godhead, within the Trinity. Because whether you recognize it or not, all three of them are being introduced here and we're getting insight as to what they do in our lives. It says, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. Who is to be obedient to Jesus Christ? The elect, the chosen. We are to be obedient to Jesus Christ. So that what? We are sprinkled with His blood. Make no mi mistake about it, church. There is a reason that it says, and sprinkled with His blood after it says, obedience to Christ. See, I think, again, church, this is something that I want to bring uh, 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 clarity to this body this morning. It is true that God foreknew you. It is true that you have a responsibility to be obedient to Christ. Even as the chosen, even as the elect. 
Without that, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen? I think that obedient part, and I think you guys know this, anybody who's ever sat under any teaching of mine, obedience is something that I always go back to because this is where I recognize in my very young age, in my very young Christian walk, where we get it wrong. And, and, and who I, the, 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 the portion of Scripture I want to dive to to point out an example is Jonah. Why Jonah? It is a very familiar story. Most people, because it's only four chapters, has taken the time to read it. And that's just truth. Not to mention there's no other scene in all of Scripture that's talked about that is just so unique. Right? And just to review Jonah, Jonah is a prophet of God, and God speaks to Jonah. Did you guys hear that? God speaks to Jonah. Not unknowing to Jonah. Jonah knew God was speaking to him. It caused him to do something. He reacted because of something God had told him to do. He disobeyed. He fled from what God was calling him to do. See, we find out in chapter 4 of Jonah that he had this hate in his heart for Nineveh. For the Assyrians. He had a hate for them. He did not want them to receive God's grace, love, and mercy. In fact, that's why he goes on to tell God, this is why I did not obey what you've called me, what you wanted me to do. This is why I fled. Because I did not want, I knew you were a God of love. I knew you were a God of grace. I knew you were a God of mercy. I knew you would forgive them. I did not want you to forgive them. That's the message, essentially, that he shares with us in, in chapter 4. But let's talk about chapter 1. He, he flees from what God is calling him to do. What is, he's being disobedient. What does that mean? He's rebelling against God. This is the very thing that he hated the Assyrians for. Because they were in rebellion against God. What a hypocrite. That is the very definition of a hypocrite. Oh God, thank you for forgiving me. But those people over there, they don't deserve it. How many of us are guilty of, of something like that here this morning? How many of us harbor hate for somebody that we know in our lives? God created them in His image just like He did you. Just like He did you. And He wants them to have the opportunity to receive His truth just like you had the opportunity. Amen? But listen to what happens. Because this actually happens so much in our own lives. He boards this ship headed for Tarshish, and what does he do? This storm comes up. It's such a bad storm, it sends everybody on the boat in panic. And it's very clear that these other people on the boat, they start praying to their gods, it says. It's very clear that they are not praying to the God of the Bible. They are not praying to the one true God. They are praying to fictitious, false gods and the storm is going crazy they're freaking out and in the midst of this jonah decides to go down in the bottom of the ship and take a nap because he knows he knows what it's all about the captain of the ship he noticed he took notice that that's not normal that man that seems to be so calm in the middle of this storm that's not normal so he goes and he asks Jonah about it, and Jonah spills the beans. He lets them know, yeah, it's my fault. And you know what? The people of the boat, and in fact, let me just make this clear. He didn't say, he didn't spill the beans until the lot, the lot was cast to him, until it, it really came down to uh, God showing them who was at fault. And when it fell on him, then he spilled the beans. After he spilled the beans, this says they were terrified. And they said, what should we do with you? Asking Jonah, what should we do with you to make this stop? These people in the, minute, uh, in the middle of panic, in the face of death, was asking Jonah, what should we do with you to make this stop? To make this flee from us? Jonah says, throw me over the boat. Kill me. Get rid of me. Most people would have obliged. 
Most people would have said, okay, especially in our culture today, anything that makes it more convenient for us, anything that makes it more comfortable for us, but listen to this because this is the point I want to make. These people who are not even God's children, don't even know God, refuse to do it. Even knowing that it's for their own good. They seen value in Jonah. They refused. They frantically tried, tried rowing back to the shore. They put in every effort they could to not resort to causing harm to Jonah. Church, why is it that sometimes some of the most moral seeming people are the farthest from God? Why is it that when we open our eyes to the culture around us and the people around us, we see people carrying themselves in a loving way, in a loving way towards other people, in a better way, in a more called for way that God has called, called us to, than what Christians do? This is the example we're being shown in Jonah. These people were unwilling, even though it was going to be beneficial to them, to the point of death, to love Jonah. After they seen that everything that they, all the effort, every, all the energy that they poured out to row towards the shore, to not bring this onto Jonah, did they plead to God, a God that before they did not know, but now they're pleading to Jonah's God, or pleading towards Jonah's God, amen? And they're saying, God, don't hold this against us. Don't hold this against us because you're doing what, what you're pleasing to do, what you want to do. And they threw Jonah overboard. You think that would be enough of a lesson for Jonah? But what happens in chapter 4? After he preaches, after he finally stops being rebellious, and by the way, he wasn't he didn't cease being rebellious because he cared for Nineveh. He ceased being rebellious because God spared him from death. Boy, was he thankful that God spared him. Even when the plant that God caused to grow over him to provide him shade because of the heat. Oh, oh man, he delighted in that. That felt good to him. Why? Because it was all about him. He was mad. He was mad that the Assyrians in Nineveh repented and that God spared them. He was upset. And you know what God's reply to him was? How can I not care? If there's 120,000 people in Nineveh. Should I not care for them? These people, they don't know their right hand from their left. What he's saying is they don't know any better. We're seeing a world today that doesn't know any better. They're acting the way that they're acting church because they don't know any better. And just like Jonah being called to go to Nineveh, we're called to go into the world so that they have an opportunity to turn towards God. Amen? So that they have an opportunity to turn towards God. How many of us are living in rebellion? How many of us know God like Jonah did? How many of us know the clear commands of God like Jonah did? How many of us know the clear commands of God and are walking in rebellion? You may not recognize your rebellion, but if you're taking God's word, God's truth, that knowledge that you have and you're keeping it to yourself and you're not sharing it with people who don't know, if you're not using God's truth and God's knowledge that He shared with us through the Holy Scriptures to raise your family in the way that they should go, you're walking in rebellion. Every single one of us are still in sinful flesh. Every single one of us are still dwelling in a flesh that is rebellious to God. Every single one of us have a choice to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. Every single day. Every single day. 
Let's go back to 1 Peter. Oh, yeah, I'm already still in 1 Peter. I guess I never turned. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Peter talks to this call about being holy. And I just want to read through the rest of the chapter. It says, therefore, I really wish... <laughs> i spend the time to tell you what it's there for. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. So I want to point this verse out because it's very important. It's very important for this to be clear that Peter is addressing those who are the chosen, those who are the elect, those who know God. And he is warning them to not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. There is a responsibility that we have. Yes, God is sanctifying us. Yes, the Holy Spirit is doing a sanctifying work within us. That is something that only God can do. But we have a responsibility. We have something that we're called to. We have something to attribute in all of this. Amen? And this is what it's saying, and I'm going to read it one more time. It says, as obedient children. Wait a minute. If you're obedient, doesn't that mean that you're doing what God has called you to do? But it doesn't keep Peter from warning them. It doesn't keep Peter from warning them about entering in rebellion again. He says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as you, or just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Gosh, that's tough. Is that not a tough verse to swallow? As God is holy, He expects us and wants us to be holy? By a show of hands, how many people in this room feel that they're holy? There's a reason for that. And, and, and let me finish this verse and then I want to dive back and I want to address that because it's very important for us to understand why it is that we don't feel holy. Be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. The reason that when we read Scripture we feel convicted, the reason that when the true Word of God is being preached to us, we feel convicted, the reason that we feel shame when we hear the word, be holy because I am holy, is because, church, we can't do that. We can never live out the gospel message perfectly while in this flesh. We can't do it. I want you to know that the devil will come along and try to beat you up because of verses like this. See, the reason, the reason that for that conviction and the reason it's so important for you to always grasp and truly feel that you're not holy is because you're not. It keeps us in this state of mind that we need a savior that we can't do it without god because the moment we realize or the moment we think we can do it without god the moment we think that we've achieved holiness without god you're in a dangerous place that's where the pharisees were at they thought they were holier than thou but christ came along and said man i came for the sick i didn't call to, i didn't come to call the righteous or the healthy, I came to call the sick. Again, Jesus was not calling the Pharisees healthy. He was simply stating that you think you're healthy. He came for those who acknowledge and realize that they're broken. You cannot come to the knowledge of truth. You cannot come to the knowledge of God. You cannot come to, to, to the Savior until you understand that you are truly broken. You are a sinner. There's nothing you can do outside of Christ to be holy in God's sight. There is a reason that when you read Scripture, you feel conviction. It is the perfect law of God. And that's why it says those who are trying to obtain righteousness by the law, 
then you're never going to get there. It's only by the grace and the mercy of Christ. But just because it's by the grace and mercy of Christ does not mean that you're not called to obedience. Just as our children fall short, just as our children will not obey what we command them to obey perfectly, we'll never, this side of, the, of eternity, be able to do it. It keeps us in this place where we're always standing in reverence of God. And in fact, I'm going to get to that because I'm pretty sure within this first Peter, I'm pretty sure it says something about that reverence. So let me move on. Since you call on a father who judges each, per each person's works impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Reverence for who? Reverence for God. Wait a minute. Everything that I just laid out in front of you, the very next verse, is speaking with absolute clarity. Why do we feel conviction? Why does it make us uncomfortable? Why does it breed fear within us? Am I, which of you read scripture and sometimes do not feel that, man, am I in Christ? Am I walking with God? That's a fear, that's a healthy fear that you have because of the reverence that you have for who? God. Understand when you fall short or when you feel that you're falling short, the reason is is because you recognize God's holiness. You recognize the perfection of God's word. You recognize that. And you also have this annoying voice inside of you reminding you that you fall short of that. So let me encourage you this morning, if that's you, if that's you, you are standing on healthy legs. You are standing on healthy grounds because you understand and grasp the holiness of God. Am I speaking with clarity? For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from, from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen. Oh, listen to this. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. What are you saying, Brandon? What are you saying? Wasn't it Adam and, Adam and Eve's choice to eat of the, 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 the fruit that was in the garden? Wasn't it, wasn't it their choice? Yeah, it was. But God knew ahead of time that they were going to eat it. He knew. That's why it says he for, the, the, uh, that's why it says right here that Jesus Christ himself was chosen before the creation of the world. Because God knew, God knew that we were going to fall short. So are you telling me that this whole thing has been, been part of a, God, a holy, perfect God's plan? No, I'm not telling you that. Scripture is telling you that. It's hard to wrap your head around. But God also gives us reassurance that our thoughts are not His thoughts. If you're having trouble wrapping your head around that this morning... Good. If you think you got that figured out, we need to have a conversation. God keeps us leaning on Him with the things that we don't understand, with the things that we don't know. It says, through Him you believe in God who raised Him from the dead and glorified Him and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you are purified yourselves by what? By obeying the truth. Yes, it's true, church, that you're purified by the blood of Christ. But you're not purified by the blood of Christ unless you are obeying Christ as your Lord. Is that clear? Now that you have purified yourselves by, by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, 
So it's saying you're, by obeying the truth, it's, it's for having sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Church, there have been many, many movements against the word of God. Every single one of those movements, maybe the concepts might live on, but the people who were engaged in them are gone. Those people who were the starters of great movements against the Holy Word of God, they're dead. I'm, I'm trying to do my best to stand in front of you and pe preach truth this morning, but one day, I'll be dead. You know what will still be here? The Word of God. So the most important thing that we can do as Christians is bring back the reality that this is the authority that it claims to be. Because if generations underneath of us are, raising, are being raised up to believe that, that this is not true, that it's not the Word of God, that it's not something that we can lean wholeheartedly on, That doesn't affect God, it affects them. It affects our future generation. Amen? So again, I will close with just reiterating on a, a point. It is true that God is sovereign. It is true that it is by His work and his initiative, again, in First Peter in the beginning, there's a reason in the order that it's spoken. It is by God's initiative that you are even in Christ. Or have the opportunity to be in Christ. It is by his initiative, not yours. You didn't luck out. You are sitting in this room hearing truth because God initiated that. That's just solid truth. But what follows that, church is what I desperately want everybody here this morning. What follows that is our obedience to who? To Christ. For what? So that you can be sprinkled by the blood. There is this beautiful truth that we cannot wrap our head around. That God foreknew you before the foundations of the earth. He foreknew whether you were going to choose Him or not. And He's giving you every opportunity to say yes. Because He loves you that much. He's giving you every opportunity to say yes. Not only to say yes, but wholeheartedly follow Him. Because again, as I'm here to remind you, as I'm here uh, trusted with this position to speak truth to you, you cannot walk with Christ half-heartedly. You can't do it. There's a reason in chapter 7 it says that many will say to Him, Lord, Lord. And many people on that day will find out that God will say, I never knew you. Because many people will be swayed into thinking that they're in Christ, but not living wholeheartedly for Him. And I'm here to tell you, if that's you this morning, you are not in Christ. But it's an opportunity for you to say yes and dive wholeheartedly into walking with Christ. And again, I'm feeling convicted to point out to you that has nothing to do with you living your life out perfectly for God. It has everything to do with the effort that you're putting into living your life for God. God knows your heart. He knows how much you love Him. And it is by your action that shows how much you love Him. Not Him, but you and the people around you. Somewhere in between the portion I read in 1 Peter and the, the later portion I read in 1 Peter, it explains the fact that, church, we all have this grand opportunity to serve Him. We all have this great and glorious opportunity to serve Him. 
but it's on us. It's up to us. And it's by those works and by the, by the challenges that we, that, that we experience, the things that we have to endure, the trials and the temptations, that show us where we're at in our walk with Christ. And because I know I didn't do a phenomenal job, I'm going to go back and read. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace, this is verse 10, that was come to you searched intently. How did they search? Intently and with the greatest care. So again, your walk has everything to do with your intention and how much care you put into your walk. Amen? Trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, and living, or, and even angels long to look into these things. I really am making every effort to try to pour this out as clear as possible, but I, I do feel like I'm falling short. I'm going to pray and I'm going to close. If you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have anything dwelling inside of you that feels like, man, I'm, I'm not living my life for Christ, I'll be up here to pray for you. If you know without a shadow of a doubt that you haven't been living your life for Christ, I'm here to pray with you. Let us pray. Holy Father, I come to you in prayer. Lord, I love you and I thank you for just how perfect you are. Lord, I, I love you and I thank you that, Lord, the boundaries that you lay out for us are just so clear. Lord, I pray that on every individual who, who hears this message, whether it be in this congregation or, or somebody who hears the message um, elsewhere, Lord, I pray that you would bring them to their knees, that you would help them to see their brokenness. Lord, and I pray that if there's any part of them, any desire in them to know truth, Lord, I, I pray that you would grab a hold of that and you would tug. Lord, and, and, and that you would open their eyes, that you would bring them to the side of truth, that you would let them know just how much you care for them, just how much you love them, Lord, and just how much you want them to be with you for eternity. Lord, you are so good. Lord, help us to lean on you and trust you all the days of our life from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep. No matter our circumstances, Lord, no matter what this world brings against us, no matter what kind of persecution we might face, Lord, I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes wholeheartedly on you. Lord, we love you, we lift you up, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, you guys are dismissed. I do encourage you guys, um, you are responsible for your walk. And the effort that you're putting forth just like the prophets of long ago, they searched intently and with the greatest care. Remember that verse that says, if you, seek, if you seek me with your whole heart, you'll find me. Guys, it is not works. It is not works to make the effort to know God. It is not works to walk in obedience to God. Don't let the message that Christ uh, blood is free of charge, confuse you. Don't let the message be, or don't let the message confuse you that blood, the, the, the blood of Christ is for everyone. Confuse you. The blood of Christ is for everybody who is willing to walk in obedience to what he had to say. And, and, and this is where we get to rest assured in the areas where we know wholeheartedly when we examine ourselves that we fall short, that the Holy Spirit dwells in us and is sanctifying us. That is the portion that gives us hope to know that God will bring us to the place of perfection, 
the, what, the, the, the person that he intends us to be. Amen? Amen. I hope that's clear this morning. Uh, you guys love on each other. If you have any questions, linger, ask. I'm here. Bob's here. Clayton's here. We're all here. Hey! Love you guys.